For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. So, uh, did anyone see what happened yesterday with Scotty Scheffler? That was bizarre, right? For those who have no idea what I'm talking about, allow me to briefly explain. Scotty Scheffler is the best golfer in the world as of this very moment. He won the Masters a month ago, and he was off to an incredible start at the PGA Championship, being at minus four through the first round. On Friday, Scheffler was driving to the facility where the championship was being played, as he was getting ready to tee off. Unfortunately, a horrible tragedy occurred when a shuttle bus struck a worker, killing the man. Because of the heavy rains in the incident, police decided to close off the road outside the golf course and push back the start time of the second round by an hour and 20 minutes. No one was allowed to drive on the road, except for the golfers. If you had to play in the second round, you could enter the facility that way and bypass the police. Well, Scheffler was directed to go that way by police, and seeing as he was in a marked vehicle and was playing in the second round, thought that he was in the clear, just like every other golfer. However, an officer attached himself to Scheffler's car, thinking that he wasn't a golfer and that his vehicle didn't have permission to do this. Scheffler then was asked to step out of the vehicle, and as he was complying with the request, he was yanked from his car and was detained and arrested. Scheffler now faces charges of second-degree assault of a police officer, third-degree criminal mischief, reckless driving, and disregarding traffic signals from an officer directing traffic. Scheffler was released from jail just an hour before he was set to tee off, as he was literally going through his warm-up routine in the holding cell to stay loose. And amazingly enough, Scheffler actually shot minus five, putting him in a tie for fourth heading into the weekend. So this didn't impact him the slightest bit from a performance standpoint. We'll see how many of the charges stick, but there will definitely be lawyers involved, a lawsuit is probably going to happen, and everything about what happened on Friday was absolutely hectic, absolutely chaotic, and was a horrible look for the golf course and for the city. It was also one of the craziest things we've ever seen in the history of golf. I don't think that's hyperbole or recency bias. I mean... The number one player in the world getting arrested as he's literally trying to enter the golf course? Seems insane to think about, and seems like something that has never happened before. Well, I bring up the Scotty Scheffler incident because, amazingly enough, this was not the first time in sports that a player was arrested by police trying to enter the facility. Life's a funny thing. You think you're pulling into the facility to play. And the next thing you know, you're dealing with the police and you're in cuffs and you're arrested. Because in 2001, that's exactly what happened with this man right here. New York Jets safety Damian Robinson. In 2001, prior to entering Giant Stadium before a game, Robinson was arrested and his life was flipped upside down. And we're set to break that incident down today. Because this is the story behind Damian Robinson. As in the player on the Jets, who was arrested while trying to enter the game. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand just who Damian Robinson was, and the importance of the game at hand, as well as how the game was going. It's October 14th, 2001. It's week 5 of the NFL season, and we've got a big divisional game on our hands over at Giants Stadium in the Meadowlands between two AFC East rivals the New York Jets, and the Miami Dolphins. For the main team in our story, the Jets, this felt like a pretty big game for them. New York entered this one at 2-2, two and, two, and with the Miami Dolphins atop the division at 3-1, and one, a loss here could be absolutely detrimental from the standpoint of keeping up with them for the division crown and a possible home game in the playoffs. Drop to 2-3, and three, and not only are you two back on Miami without the tiebreaker, meaning that you're going to have a lot of work ahead of you trying to claw your way back into first, but you're in a logjam with a ton of other teams in the AFC that you are unlikely to survive, as over the past two seasons in the AFC, only once did a team make the playoffs after being below 500 after five games. I don't want to say early on in the season that this was a must-win game, 
but it certainly felt that way. And the good news for the Jets was that, yes, they did, in fact, win this game, as you can probably tell from these highlights. When the final whistle sounded, it was the Jets who emerged victorious, taking it over the Dolphins by a final score of 21-17. Obviously, the game was not as good as the last time the teams met at Giants Stadium in 2000, during one of the greatest regular season games and Monday Night Football games of all time. But the Jets did pull off another incredible comeback, as after trailing 17-0 at the half, they score the final 21 points of the game in the second half, thanks to two touchdown passes by Vinny Testaverde to Lavernius Coles, and a touchdown run by Curtis Martin sandwiched in between there, on a day where the future Hall of Fame running back had 120 yards on nearly 6 yards per carry. At one point, the Jets scored two touchdowns in a span of 24 seconds, and the defense did its job and then some, forcing four turnovers and holding Miami to no points and 98 yards of offense over their final six drives. The Jets outgained the Dolphins a whopping 283 to 98 from a yardage standpoint in the second half, nearly tripling Miami's output in that department. And if any Dolphin fans were delusional enough after the 2000 season in thinking that getting a lead against the Jets was safe, this was the game that 100% confirmed the fact that, no, in fact, no lead against the Jets is safe. If they came back from down 30-3 in the fourth quarter, 17-0 at the half is child's play for them. So this was a great game for the Jets to put them above 500 and put them on the right track to make the playoffs for the first time since 1998 and just the second time in the last decade, right? Well, not entirely. Because despite the 17-point comeback, despite the great win against the divisional opponent, and despite the significance of the scheme, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for the team. There was a fair amount of controversy. Because we need to talk about this man right here. This is the starting free safety on the Jets, a man by the name of Damian Robinson. After spending the past three seasons in Tampa Bay, where new Jets head coach Herm Edwards was on the staff, Robinson came over to the Jets during the 2001 offseason in free agency. And the Jets had high expectations for the man seeing as Robinson started in all 16 games for the Bucks in 1999 when they had a great defense and made it to the NFC Championship for just the second time in franchise history. And he also started all 16 games in 2000. In fact, during that 2000 season, Robinson had six interceptions, which was seventh in the entire NFL and would have been the most on the team for the Jets. If the Jets could add another ball hawk at safety to pair alongside Victor Green, on paper, that could be one of, if not, the best safety combinations in all of football. Robinson signed a five-year, $10 million deal to join the team. And if that might not seem like a lot, keep in mind that the salary cap in 2001 was $67.4 million. So he took up 2.9% of the cap. Today, the cap is at $255.4 million. So that would be the equivalent of $7.6 million per year which would make him one of the highest paid safeties in football. He's in the top 25% amongst all starters. You get the idea. This man was good, or at the very least, was supposed to be good. The Jets needed him, and didn't need him getting himself into any trouble. But they could not have foreseen him getting into trouble, quite literally, as he was entering the stadium for the game. Because unfortunately, we had to talk about what happened one month before during that 2001 season, just a few miles from where the Jets played their games. On September 11, 2001, the deadliest attack on American soil occurred when four planes were hijacked, with two of the planes hitting the Twin Towers, some of the most iconic buildings in New York City where thousands of people worked. 3,000 people died during the attacks and thousands more would die in the aftermath due to the effects of the secondhand smoke. I don't need to describe what happened on 9-11, but basically, America shut down, and life as we knew it, especially from a security standpoint, would never be the same. The NFL didn't play in the week after the attacks. Airport travel changed forever, and everyone, especially in New York, was on heightened security alert. There were very few moments in life where there is a clear marker for the world before and the world after. This was one of them. 
as you can clearly mark in a lot of ways the difference between a pre-9-11 and a post-9-11 world in the United States. And when it came to this game right here between the Dolphins and the Jets, remember, this was taking place one month after the attacks. Everyone still had 9-11 in the back of their minds. The wounds were fresh. Anything that could be perceived as a threat was taken as such. You had heightened security at all of the NFL games, and especially for the games involving the Jets and the Giants at the Meadowlands for obvious reasons. You wanted to bring in anything to the stadium that was larger than a small purse? You couldn't do that anymore. You wanted to get into the stadium quickly? You couldn't do that. You had to deal with your car getting expected, had to deal with having to park further away from the stadium than usual because all the spots immediately next to the stadium were blocked off for security purposes in case a bomb was there, and then you had to get past the bomb-sniffing dogs, the metal detectors, and the SWAT teams. For some perspective on what the immediate aftermath of the post-9-11 world was like, at one of the games, one person tried to bring in a miniature American flag, and security almost confiscated the flag because the pointy tip at the end was considered, at first, to be a weapon. You get the idea. In the wake of 9-11, games were a heck of a lot different from a security standpoint, especially from the car inspection part. But you want to know what was never allowed at any point, whether it was a pre-9-11 world or a post-9-11 world, but especially in New York and New Jersey in the month after 9-11? That's right, guns! Freaking guns! And you'll never believe what this man right here, Damian Robinson, had in his car driving into the stadium. It's almost like saying, I'm gonna shoot up the school. It was never okay to say that, but especially in the immediate aftermath of a school shooting, especially one that happened in your hometown, you're gonna be under way more scrutiny and be looked at as way more of a threat and way more of an idiot. Because when Robinson was entering Giant Stadium at 10 a.m., six hours before the late afternoon kickoff, his car was searched by police and bomb-sniffing dogs. Because of course it was going to be. This was a month after 9-11, just a few miles outside New York City, at a time when 80,000 people were going to be congregating together in one area. And this was just the second home game for the Jets since the attacks. So there was going to be extremely heightened security. And when the search on the car was conducted, the police found, well, they, they found a lot, I'll put it that way. By a lot, I mean a Bushmaster 223 assault rifle, three high-capacity magazines holding 30 rounds each, and not one, but two boxes of ammunition with 100 rounds each. So doing some quick math, that's 200 rounds of ammunition. Not only is that illegal in New Jersey under a 1990 state law banning the possession of certain automatic weapons, but especially in the wake of 9-11, in a place of mass gathering? Yeah, that's extremely illegal. As you can probably guess, Robinson had these weapons in his car because he was at the shooting range the previous week and just forgot to take them out of his car. However, as you can also probably guess, Robinson was arrested right then and there, meaning that the starting free safety on the Jets was in cuffs before the game was about to kick off. Because of course he was going to be. There was no other possible outcome, and there was no other possible way that this could go, especially considering the time and place. Now, Robinson was released and ended up playing in the game, but Herm Edwards had no idea about the incident until 3.40, as in... 20 minutes before kickoff. He was getting ready to address the team for the final time and go over some quick plays, and then was informed by a team official that, oh yeah, by the way, your starting free safety was arrested at the stadium today. What do you want to do about it? Robinson's troubles were not end there. Robinson was fined $30,000, so a week of pay, and he had to undergo community service and counseling. He was not suspended by the Jets, nor was he suspended by the league, because in the eyes of Herm Edwards, he just made an honest mistake, and it sure seems that way. An honest mistake in, quite literally, the worst possible place to make one in at the worst possible time to do it. Said Edwards on the incident, I looked at him and said, what are you thinking? 
and he had his head down. He felt bad. And I said, are you alright? I said, we all make mistakes, and we'll deal with it after the game. We'll get whatever punishment necessary. I have no idea why people own weapons anyway. Period. End of story. However, if you know Damien or know anyone with any kind of sense, to me, it's an honest mistake. The last four weeks after 9-11, cars are being checked. You have policemen and patrolmen with rifles and guns, and you know they're going to check your car. And he drives into the stadium with his wife and two kids. They go back there and they find it and he goes, oh no. That's the story he told me. Obviously, he made a mistake. I've got to believe Damien and the story he gave me. He didn't let me down so much. He has to deal with his family, and he let his family down. He's a good man. He wouldn't do anything to draw anything like this on himself. He forgot that it was in his automobile, and I've got to believe that. I should also note that Robinson was a first-time offender here. And even other people around the league were shocked by this. Of all people, Damien Robinson? Really? Lovey Smith, who coached Robinson in Tampa Bay and was now the defensive coordinator on the St. Louis Rams, said on Robinson's arrest, I trusted Robinson as much as I trusted anyone. He's one of the good guys. I say that with no hesitation. He's not one of the bad guys that we have to worry about in this league. Robinson faced up to five years in prison, but ended up not going to prison as the charges were dropped. And from everything I could find, this was the only thing on his record. So this truly seemed like a genuine mistake, or he just forgot that he left the weapons in his car from the shooting range. He hasn't had any incidents since 2001, and didn't have any before that. Said Jimmy Gold, who was Robinson's agent, it was very innocent in that respect. He genuinely forgot that he left it. It's an innocent mistake. He made a huge mistake there. He has to deal with it now, and it will not be easy for him. We support what the club has done. And even though Robinson had support from his teammates, with cornerback Ray Mickens saying, it was a big mistake, but an honest mistake, Robinson genuinely seemed shaken up from the incident and the aftermath of it, kicking himself and not being able to believe that he just did that, saying, I think it was a bad mistake, and right now, I'm just trying to get over it. It's something serious that you always have in the back of your mind after every play. If this took place in 2002 or 2003, or any other year where they're not inspecting your car, Robinson never gets arrested. Heck, if Robinson was playing for, quite literally, any of the other 29 teams of the time outside of the Meadowlands, he might never get arrested. There was no ill intent here whatsoever, especially knowing Robinson's clean record before and after this as this definitely felt like a mistake. It just happened to be a really big mistake at the worst possible time in the worst possible place. And what's crazy about the incident involving the man that played for this team behind me right here is that usually with these kinds of things, I would talk at the very end of the video about how this is his lasting legacy, and this is how people remember him a quarter century later. But I can't even do that here. Not only is this incident by Robinson not on his Wikipedia page, but it got overshadowed by something that Robinson did one month later in a Sunday night football game on ESPN against the New Orleans Saints. The incident with Aaron Brooks and Kyle Turley. That's a video for another time, because that was absolutely insane. There was a month-long stretch where Damian Robinson just couldn't stand out the news for one reason or another. And it's crazy, though, that no one really remembers this one, I remember the Turley incident, but no one remembers this one. I got overshadowed, which is kind of hard to get overshadowed when you literally got arrested, the starting free safety at one of the biggest acquisitions of the entire offseason by any team that year as he's entering the stadium. So what's the moral of the story involving this man right here? If you are an NFL player and you own a gun, make sure you check your car before driving to the stadium to make sure that the gun is not in your car. The five seconds it takes to check are worth it compared to the fines and arrests and punishments you could face if you accidentally leave it there. If you're going to go to the shooting range and engage in such activities, just make sure the things you bring to that are nowhere to be found when you're going to a stadium with 80,000 people congregating, 
especially when league policy says, unsurprisingly, that you can't have guns or weapons at any part of any facility. Because when it came to this man right here, prior to a 2001 game against the Miami Dolphins, by not checking his car before driving to the game, Damian Robinson definitely shot himself in the foot. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.